Welcome to the Source Material Comics Podcast. We are celebrating once again the Super Blog Team Up, and this entry is going to be me, your host, Jesse Starcher, just doing a solo shot. The topic for this event, bring on the replacements. Yes, we are going to be discussing replacement superheroes in this event, and I can't wait to see what all of the super blog team up members are going to be submitting blog wise, podcast wise, otherwise. But my entry took me a little bit to kind of nail down what I was going to do. And what I landed on was what I think could be considered the most polarizing replacement superhero of all time. So polarizing, in fact, that in the late 80s, the readers. You know where I'm going with this. You saw the title of the episode. The readers voted to kill this replacement hero. Yes, I am talking about Jason Todd, the second version of Robin. Let me just preface this by saying, if you are a well-read comic book aficionado, then a lot of what I'm going to go through today is probably something that you already know. But if you have someone that you know that maybe would enjoy listening to this bit of history, then feel free to share this podcast with them. The more eyes on the Superblog team up, the better. Uh, But let me start personally and talk about what a death in the family meant to me. So this occurs in 1988. I was not a big consumer of comics at 10 years old. I was buying a few here and there, but I was a Marvel zombie wasn't buying much Batman. We're just about to hit 89 where Michael Keaton's Batman hits the theaters and things ramp up at that point for Batman. The knowledge base of who Batman is is off the charts with the Tim Burton film. But in 88, I'm collecting Amazing Spider-Man, so I'm not fully aware of what's going on in the Batman titles. However, I want to say maybe three or four years later, we'll say... 90, 91, 92, probably, honestly, between 90 and 91, went to a comic book store. One of these, the guy probably lived above the store and opened it up during the day. Not a well-organized shop in any way. And for the early 90s, comic book shops in Southeast Ohio, parts of West Virginia, are not too common. This was books and things in Parkersburg, West Virginia, which is no longer there. But I can remember it was a real treat to go to that store when I could. Number one, I had to talk to my parents. My parents were separated, so dad lived closer to Parkersburg. And sometimes if I could just talk him into letting me go to books and things over in Parkersburg, it was still a good 20-minute drive. And dad never saw my dad pick up a comic book in his life. So (laughs) it's kind of hard for me to convince this man to let me go to a place called Books and Things. I don't know if I've ever seen dad read a book. Safe to say this wasn't his thing. But I got to go to Books and Things one time. Walking in there, I remember they carried stuff that I didn't see anywhere else. My exposure to comic books at that time, as I've said on here many times before, was Kroger, grocery stores. People's News, which was a magazine newspaper outlet. Those were the only times that I can remember seeing comic books. So they were the single issue format. Nobody ever carried graphic novels. Books and things did. They carried complete stories. And I always thought that was the coolest thing ever (laughs) to buy a thick comic that had a complete story in it. The problem is, is it's just a little bit expensive. Could I convince mom or dad to give me the money? Hey, I got my allowance. It was was two weeks allowance, maybe three weeks allowance to try and get one of these graphic novels. And I found a death in the family on the shelves. And the cover was pretty striking. You've all probably seen the cover. It's completely black. And Batman is on his knees cradling a dead Robin. Honestly, I wasn't reading the back of the books. 
I was looking at a cover and going, ooh, this looks interesting. As a kid, you're not making those informed choices. You don't have somebody, especially in the early 90s, I didn't have somebody to talk to to tell me, okay, this is a comic that you want to get your hands on. Wizard Magazine wasn't a thing for me at that point. So I didn't know much about this storyline. So it had to have been the cover that grabbed me. And I, I bought it. I didn't realize kind of like the brutality that waited for me in this book. So all in all... That's how I ended up being aware of who Jason Todd was and that Jason Todd wasn't the Robin that we were all so used to. And then things got real interesting when I learned about the voting and the poll where people made a decision to determine if Robin, Jason Todd, was going to live or die. That's, in a nutshell, how I first became aware of Jason Todd and probably the first replacement hero that I read about, knowingly. But we can't start there. We have to talk about Dick Grayson first. Dick Grayson was the first Robin. First appearance, Detective Comics number 38 in April of 1940, created by Bill Finger and Bob Kane. Has a bit of a tragic origin story, much like Batman's, where Grayson's family is killed. Uh, He was part of a circus trapeze act called the Flying Grayson's, And his parents were killed in front of him in a horrific fashion where they orchestrated their deaths by causing them to fall from the trapeze in front of in front of Dick Grayson. Bruce Wayne ends up taking him in and adopts him, training him to become Robin. So why is it important for Batman to have a Robin? I think the main answer to that's pretty clear. (laughs) Batman's a little unhinged. Robin grounds Batman. He also humanizes him. Batman's often portrayed as a dark and brooding crime fighter. He's consumed by his war on crime. And Robin serves as this counterbalance to Batman, bringing a sense of humanity and and warmth to the character. And their partnership showcases Batman's capacity for compassion and mentorship, making him more relatable. When you paired Robin with Batman, you got the dynamic duo. Their synergy, their teamwork, all was recognized by the readers. And also, Batman appreciated the fact that Dick Grayson had some fantastic skills as a crime fighter. Also, he was a good investigator, too. As both of them played off of each other, they also were able to fight crime that much better. There's some pretty cynical takes out there about how Batman needs a target. Batman's in the shadows, kind of hiding out, while Dick Grayson is in this bright, colorful outfit, drawing the eyes of the criminals away from Batman so Batman can make his move. The audience also identified with Dick Grayson as Robin. Robin appealed to young readers. This is every young child's kind of fantasy to become someone that can help a superhero, thereby becoming a superhero in and of themselves. That also allows our storytellers to kind of use Robin as a audience surrogate to ask Batman questions, kind of talk the story out between the two. Because if you didn't have that, you'd have Batman talking to himself a lot. (laughs) Or he'd be, we'd be getting a lot of inner monologue. So absolutely, Robin's there to help facilitate commentary. The other thing, and I think this is important to remember, he helps provide a moral compass for Batman. It reinforces Batman's moral code, sense of responsibility to not severely hurt the criminal in front of a young kid. One would argue that, well, hey, man, how about you just don't have the young kid in a situation like that in the first place? But that would defeat the purpose of writing a good story. But it's a good way to also get the reader to understand concepts of like courage, justice, compassion. Robin as a child is someone that Bruce wants to guide, wants to help. So Dick Grayson, being the first Robin, set all of those things into motion. As the original Robin, Dick Grayson set the standard for all future sidekicks in teenage superheroes and comics. His introduction as Batman's young ward in 1940 paves the way for the creation of sidekick characters all over the place. In the comics... Most characters can stay perpetually the same age. But as time goes on, for a character that was created in the 40s, by 1960, people are probably like, okay, hasn't this kid grown up yet? 20 years have passed since he showed up. So when we finally hit the 80s, 
Dick Grayson, who had already helped form the Teen Titans, decides to finally grow into a superhero all his own and no longer be a sidekick. So speaking of the Teen Titans, yes, he was a founding member. He inspired a new generation of teenage superheroes and contributed to the expansion of the DC Universe at that point. Transitioning into 1984, about the midpoint of 1984, in Tales of the Teen Titans number 44, Dick Grayson finally decides to become Nightwing and moves on from being Batman's sidekick at that time. And now we have a fresh spot open for a replacement hero. Before we get into the replacement, you got to kind of ask yourself, like, why do people like Dick Grayson as Robin? They covered a lot of reasons there. Number one, he's a relatable character. Dick Grayson's portrayal as Robin often emphasized his ability to be reliable. As an orphan who experienced tragedy at a young age, Grayson's journey from circus performer to crime fighting partner of Batman resonates with readers who appreciate his resilience, his determination, his and his relatable struggles. Grayson had a dynamic personality as well, often depicted as upbeat, optimistic, charming, clearly the light to Batman's dark. <laughs> but you also could identify with his drive to mature, his drive to become a superhero, his drive to help his friend Batman out. And as Dick was the leader of the Teen Titans, and you could see him in all of the great qualities that he had, he was written to be a very likable character. So when you have a character like that that doesn't have very many flaws, one that resonated with readers for decades, how do you fill the shoes? It's not going to be easy. Enter Jason Todd. Jason first appeared in Batman number 357, in March of 1983, created by Jerry Conway and Don Newton. Initially, Jason seemed to be a carbon copy of Dick Grayson. But in 1985, something happened, something big, and that was Crisis on Infinite Earths. And that opened up an opportunity to take the chance to revamp Jason a little bit, maybe make him a little edgier and definitely different from his predecessor, since fans were having a problem getting behind this replacement superhero. Born to Catherine and Willis Todd, Jason's parents were involved in some criminal activities. His mother being a drug addict who died of an overdose, his father working as muscle for Two-Face before disappearing under suspicious circumstances. Jason then grows up in the east end of Gotham City in the infamous crime alley. So at a young age, Jason ends up of course, involved in a life of crime and makes a decision one day to, I assume, make the Christmas song a reality as the Batmobile lost its wheel to Jason Todd. <laughs> uh, well, he's attempting to make it a reality anyway. Batman finds him as Jason is attempting to steal the tires off the Batmobile. So this is his first encounter with Batman. Bruce is impressed with the kid's resourcefulness and begins to believe this kid has some potential. So Bruce makes a decision to intervene, much like he did with Dick Grayson, and he adopts him. Bruce takes Jason under his wing, puts him in a school for troubled youths, trying to steer him away from a life from crime. There is a point where Jason assists Batman in apprehending a gang of thieves. Jason is not as athletic, I guess you would say, as Dick Grayson was, but he was able to use his rage, his determination and focus it, and that caught Batman's eye. Batman is training him. He undergoes six months of rigorous training under Batman's guidance. Batman notes that while Jason may not possess Grayson's innate abilities, he can compensate with determination and discipline. So he finally gets the go-ahead, and they, Batman bestows upon him the Robin costume. A replacement has now been made. Jason Todd is now Robin. His stint as Robin, let's just say it's not going so smoothly for Batman. And it's kind of interesting when you think about the boy wonder, Dick Grayson, coming about in the 40s, the way he was written. Like I said, he was a very model character. Everything that a father would want a son to be, 
But what happens in the 80s, folks? Leave it to Beaver is not happening in the 80s. Jason Todd is rebellious and headstrong, reflecting the youth of the 1980s. He challenges authority, defies Batman. He's prone to using excessive force. Jason Todd is going to be a different Robin because of the time these comics are being written. So that leads to some controversial, controversial moments in Jason Todd's history. We only have from 1984 to 1988 for Jason Todd to be Robin. What's going to happen in those four years? One of the biggest things that happens is in Batman number 424. In Batman number 424, Jason Todd comes face to face with Felipe Garzonas, a serial rapist who has evaded prosecution due to his father's diplomatic immunity. The Garzonas' crimes deeply affect Jason, particularly when one of the victims, a girl named Gloria, hangs herself out of fear of further abuse from Garzonas. And I read those panels last night, and it's pretty harrowing. When Batman and Robin bust into Gloria's apartment and she has hung herself because of the trauma. It's scary and real. So, yeah, one thing we can say about Jason Todd as Robin, yeah, he's reflecting the culture. He's There's also some very real elements of what being a sidekick can expose you to. A superhero sidekick, man, that sounds great, huh? Kids were clamoring for that. They loved it. They loved the thought of that. But then as writer's sensibilities progressed in the 80s, what would it really be like? I think this is just an element of that. So filled with anger and a desire for justice, Jason takes matters into his own hands. When Garzonas is about to escape justice once again, Jason confronts him ahead of Batman's arrival, and the situation escalates. Garzonas is out on this balcony high above the streets outside of an apartment, and Robin shows up, and he's approaching him on the balcony and you don't see anything except Batman trying to get there and you see the screams as Felipe is falling leaving Batman to see that the only person on the balcony is Jason Todd and yes Garzonas falls to his death doesn't exactly spell out that he did it but the ambiguity of Garzonas's death raises questions about Jason's willingness to use lethal force in his pursuit of justice while Jason maintains that Garzonas fell accidentally, the circumstances suggest otherwise, leaving the readers and Batman to ponder whether Jason crossed a moral line in his actions. So this is a seed that's being planted in Batman number 424. And as we get only five more issues and we are going to be at the end of, of a death in the family. But as you can see, this character of Jason Todd is struggling with anger, morality, the blurred lines between right and wrong. It's a very real character. And of course, Batman is worried that Jason is going to go down a path that will lead to Batman versus Jason Todd at some point in the future. But Batman has this hope. He has this yearning that what he can do is he can try to redeem this kid. And it's not looking good. If he can just turn it around, Jason will be fine. He can be a great force for good. So if you're going to compare Jason Todd and Dick Grayson, here are some of the things that we can easily point out. Let's compare and contrast a little bit here. Background. All right. Dick Grayson comes from an acrobatic circus family. Parents tragically killed in a circus accident, leading to Batman bringing him on as Robin. Jason comes from a very troubled background in the east end of Gotham City, grows up in the mean streets, eventually gets caught stealing the tires off the Batmobile. Batman takes him in to train him as the second Robin. I think we all know the differences in personality between Dick and Jason here. Dick is typically depicted as a confident, charismatic, and optimistic gentleman, known for his acrobatic skills, quick wit, natural leadership. Uh, he also becomes a pretty darn good detective. He learns. And as I mentioned before, he's the light to Batman's dark. Jason, on the other hand, rebellious, impulsive, prone to anger, does not trust or respect authority sometimes. And Batman is constantly trying to bring him into the light. Not a good dynamic duo. <laughs> Dick had a deep bond with Batman. 
viewed him as a father figure, a mentor. You that came across the page. He he respected him. Like I said, it was Robin was portrayed as the kid that every father wanted. The kid grows up to be a natural leader. That's Dick Grayson. Jason Todd, however, he was the kid that every dad had. <laughs> Uh, I say every dad, but you know what I mean. Dick Grayson was the kid we all wanted, while Jason Todd was the kid we all had. He was the one that constantly butted heads with you. If you're a father, your child can be stubborn. And sometimes that stubbornness is just born out of straight spite. Like the kid doesn't want to listen to you, no matter how right you are. That's Jason Todd. And Batman tries. So that's as a aspect of their relationship, Batman, the ever-loving father, is trying his hardest with enough hard work and determination. I could turn this kid around. It's a tough thing to do. It's a tough thing to be a parent sometimes and watch your child make bad decisions. And you explain to them what they did wrong, and then you watch them do it again. That's tragic. And we ain't even got to the real tragic part of this yet. Our next discussion point here, we're going to talk about a death in the family. At least some of the main elements that happen. I've got to talk about the ad. And you probably know the ad I'm talking about. It is the ad you may have seen in DC comic books in 1988. You have Batman holding Jason Todd as Robin in his arms. Jason looks beat up. He's in costume. Mouth agape. Eyes are small slits to make it look as if he's dead. Up at the top it reads... Robin will die because the Joker wants revenge, but you can prevent it with a telephone call. And there's two numbers. <laughs> the first number being 1-900-720-2660. The Joker fails and Robin lives. The second is one 900 720 and get this, 666. The Joker succeeds and Robin will not survive. So there it is right there. It's in our hands. This ad is telling you it's in your hands. These numbers will only work in the USA and Canada between the following hours on September 15th and September 16th of 1988. But if you made a call during these hours, you were charged 50 cents for each call. When you made the call, it asked you to make an acknowledgement and you were done. This may have been possibly the first time I'd ever heard of a 900 number. <laughs> I... This is bold for a few reasons. Number one, this is very daring for a comic book company to take it upon themselves to say, one of our characters is going to live or die, and you are in control of that. And it's not just a character. Like, this isn't just Joe Schmo, the superhero. This is a representation of the sidekick. That's capital T-H-E, sidekick, Robin. And this is a kid. Jason Todd is not an adult. But DC Comics is like, hey, here's this opportunity. Why did we get, why did we get here? I want to cover an essay that Scott Peterson wrote at the beginning of this trade. If you've never heard of Scott Peterson, I should go ahead and tell you his accolades here in the front of this trade. I'll just read it here. It says he got a start in DC Comics where he edited their flagship title, Detective Comics, as well as Batman, Black and White, Green Arrow, and Nightwing. Scott also edited the Batman Adventures, the first comic in the influential adventure subgenre. He later went on to write a four-year run on Batman Gotham Adventures. He helped create not one, but two new Batgirls, the first as the co-writer of DC's first ever monthly Batgirl series, and the second as the writer of Batgirl Beyond. So Scott Peterson, he gives us his introduction and talks about this death in the family storyline that we're getting into, where fans voted to determine whether Jason Todd lived or died. Talks a little bit about the history of Robin being replaced by Jason Todd after Dick Grayson talk, uh, became Nightwing. And readers disliked the new Robin, found him abrasive, unlikable compared to Dick Grayson. And I'll say that this is 1988. So the vote happens. Okay. It's September 15th, September 16th of 1988. And people cast their votes. This doesn't become just talk amongst your fellow friends at the comic book store. It becomes an international news story. And there's a couple ways that people were looking at it. This is either a way of giving fans a voice to just say, hey, we want to change. We don't like the way the direction this 
title is going. We don't like this character. We want a change. The other is cheap ploy. DC is just wanting to capitalize off of the shock value of allowing you to decide whether a child lives or dies. And yeah, Peterson praises this story for having a lasting impact. That Jason Todd is one of the first ever reality stars where fans of a franchise property had a say in the direction of that comic, had a say in the direction of that property. And he's right when you think about it. Look at the reality TV that overtook things in the mid to late 90s. Survivor, Big Brother, you know, shows like that. Extremely popular. I think still going to today. I know Big Brother is. So Jason Todd's a trailblazer. So let's talk about the vote itself. Peterson has some thoughts. He says that a death in the family is one of the rare stories in comics that escapes the gravitational pull of comicdom and makes international headlines. I can only recall, honestly, a few news stories before the advent of the internet, or the popularity of the internet, I should say. And that's, of course, the death of Superman. He says maybe it was decided that they should have a vote. He's talking about the creative team here, or DC Comics itself. Let the fans decide the fate of the boy wonder. Have the comics play the roles of prosecution and defense. And let the readers be the judge, the jury, and maybe the executioner. He's praising that concept, that idea alone, to allow a reader to have influence and if you're reading Batman comics at this point in time, are you going to condemn a kid to death because he's making bad choices? Well, if he died, he could always come back, right? Three or four comic books later, Jason could just come back to life. He wasn't dead after all. Oh, it was a clone. It was Clayface. Certainly we have an out here. Well, the writers are going into this with permanence in mind. And we get to the point where the title of my entry to the Superblog team up becomes a part of this podcast. What did we do on those two days, September 15th and September 16th of 1988? We killed Jason Todd. So what happened? Why did we make this decision? The votes were tallied and there was a difference of a marginal amount. Matter of fact, I'll go ahead and give you the specifics of the vote. There wasn't a limit on how many times you could vote. 5,271 votes were cast for the Joker to fail and Robin live. 5,343 voted to kill Jason Todd. So there's been elements already that I've kind of talked about as to what went into our decision or those that decided to kill Jason Todd. There's some theories as to the motivations behind the people that cast votes to kill Jason Todd. Number one, there has been discussion that there may have been a bit of controversy, we'll say, in regards to the voting. Denny O'Neill even says, according to the wiki here, that hundreds of votes came in from one person. So as far as a vocal minority goes, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Man, this whole event is just like this weird precursor for something that is kind of like present in everyday social media 35 years later thumbs up thumbs down ratio canceled i'm not having a commentary here as to whether those things are right or wrong but i'm just saying that we have such agency now or perceived agency now back to the voting again one person this one vocal minority swayed the vote in order to kill jason todd but one guy who programmed his computer to dial the thumbs down number every 90 seconds for eight hours. It's some pretty advanced computing in the late 80s, you ask me. But he says it was a lawyer using a Macintosh and lived in California. And when they decided to make a death in the family a permanent end for Jason Todd, boy, did they hear about it. A blast of hate mail, according to O'Neill. Blast of hate mail. So why, why, why did Jason Todd get killed? Why was there even a vote? Why was this even a thing? Number one character unpopularity. He was not popular among fans. Jason Todd was abrasive, as I said earlier. Comparing him to Dick Grayson, he paled in comparison. And there was a contentious relationship between him and Batman. Controversial characterization. Jason Todd's character was depicted as morally ambiguous, prone to violence, some Fans probably found that a little hard to identify with or sympathize for. That's a big thing. If you don't have sympathy for a character, well, you might just dial that 266 
six number. Also, we only had four years with this character. Was there enough time to use Jason Todd as Robin to tell good stories? Probably not. Some people also had an emotional investment. They may have felt that, I don't like this kid. Hashtag not my Robin. They're passionate, passionate fans. And wow, could you imagine if we had the audacity, the companies had the bravery to allow big changes like this to be shot down by fans after four years, possibly? No, what it is now is we preach vote with your wallet and hope that the company is making a decision to pay attention to those sales figures. And the, the second to last thing feeds into the very last thing that I'm going to say as to why we voted. Why did we kill Jason Todd? A desire for dramatic change. Sometimes when something isn't going good, a hard 90 degree turn is just enough to shake things up and get eyes back on the product. Writers, I'm sure, creators, companies understand that concept. Sales are dropping. Why is that? You start looking for things. You start listening to people. You start acknowledging complaints. And the fans clearly want a change. So that feeds into the last thing that I believe is why we killed Jason Todd. And that is solely because we had the power to do so. We, as a fan base, Denny O'Neill may have heard the rumors. Was it confirmed? But there were more than 100 votes cast by other people to kill off Jason Todd. And it may not have been because they didn't like the character that much. Eh, A little bit. Kind of graded on me a little bit. But I have the opportunity to say something and direct how this comic book company is going to be writing stories possibly for years to come. I don't know if readers knew that DC was going to be like, you chose this. This kid is dead and they will keep him dead for years. He's not coming back for quite a while. He eventually does, but this is well after the death and return of Superman. This is not a dream. This is not an imaginary story. This isn't something where Bruce Wayne wakes up in a cold sweat running down to find Jason Todd training in the training room after this horrible nightmare of finding him battered and beaten by a crowbar at the hands of the Joker. Folks, if you have a chance to read A Death in the Family, which I sure hope you did before you listen to this podcast, (laughs) the title of the podcast is a spoiler in and of itself if you have not read it. But this isn't just Jason Todd dies in an explosion off panel. We are treated to a visceral bludgeoning. And I'll tell you right now, when I was reading this story as a kid, 12, 13 years old, it resonated with me. And it's very possible that Jim Starlin and Aparo here shaped what I knew comics could do as far as the violence into what I became a fan of in the 90s, what many became a fan of in the 90s. This story, A Death in the Family, was easily a stepping stone or a cornerstone even of that dark, say it with me, grim and gritty comic book stories that Alan Moore so apologized for when the 90s rolled around. For fans to have that power, that vote, to take out a replacement character. It had to be talked about here on the Source Material Comics podcast in as a part of this super blog team-up event, Replacement Heroes. So there you go. We killed Jason Todd. I don't know. There's a lot to be said about the series that I haven't said already. For sure, if you haven't had a chance, go read it again. Just look at what happens on the pages and think to yourself, took a lot of guts for DC to do this. And we get treated to the only other vote that I can remember in a comic book history, really, after this is Marvel versus DC, where you get to write in and vote. I don't recall. I'm sure there's probably other ones, but this was something else, man. All right, we're going to wrap things up here. I want to thank you for listening. I want to, again, extend my appreciation for being a part of the Superblog team up in this event. Stay tuned as we go through plugs. I want to point you towards the rest of the contributions that are going to be happening with the Superblog team up. So do not miss those. And I'm going to keep my plugs short. 
Again, my name's Jesse. This is the Source Material Comics podcast on the Source Material Comics feed from w2mnet.com, and we appreciate them as well for hosting our podcast. Check out this show where we talk about comics from any era, and then we also have, speaking of 90s comics, the Unspoken Issues podcast, solely focused on 90s comics in affiliation with the unspokendecade.com. All right. I want to turn you loose again. Thank you very much for listening. We'll talk to you soon. Have a good one. Bye-bye. All right. wanted to tell you about the rest of the contributors to the Super Blog Team Up. That's right. This went live March 27th, 2024. And the topic is Replacement Heroes. Superhero Satellite. Charlton Hero going to be doing a blog, I believe, on the reign of the Supermen. Our good buddy Evan Bevins. We'll use asterisk 51, his blog there, to discuss different heroes. Same name. Get off my lawn. The Telltale Mind will be talking about Nick Fury Jr. That's right. Then Dave's Comics Heroes blog will be putting the Blue Beetle, Origins of Ted Cord, the secret origins of Ted Cord, on display. Then we have Between the Pages blog, I Am Groot is the planned blog to help further along the super blog team up newsprint commando looks to be doing a discussion on monolith of the elementals and there may be some others out there that haven't had a chance to finalize their topics at the time i was reading this so really all you need to do is go to twitter slash x and type in hashtag sbtu look for any recent posts and you should be able to find Everybody who is contributing to Replacement Heroes for this event and share. I'll be sharing everybody's contributions. So just find me at Source Matt Cast on X. And here's my proper outro. Thanks for joining us. All of this would not be possible without W2Mnet.com. So make sure to seek them out for more podcasts. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please feel free to share. And we look forward to entertaining you again soon. Oh,